Thank you, Ken, and good morning to everybody. Beautiful morning this morning, and just so much to be thankful for in our lives today. And as we enter this Thanksgiving week, it's something that we ought to just uh, be have an attitude of just great gratitude throughout the year of all that God has done. The uh, as you see from the title of the message, finding purpose through through the spirits or spiritual gifts, um, it's kind of a continuation of last week. Last week we. Uh, and I'm going to get to that here in just a minute. But, uh, but what I want to try to do is I, I just really thought through this very, very carefully. And uh, now some of this that I'm going to talk about today is going to be a little bit more teaching. I'm, I'm not going to get into the specific gifts, spiritual gifts, if that's what you're looking for. But the, the intent of last week and this week together is to help um, people that, are, that you're sitting here today and you love Jesus and uh, sometimes, here's, here's been my experience. I've been in ministry, I guess, about 30 years or a little more than that now. And I find that there are a lot of people that love the Lord, that they're, but they're struggling to find meaning and purpose in their Christian experience. And uh, I, I am real burdened about the, the church of today. I talk about the American church because I believe that our churches are, and this is, I'm not meaning this to be harsh or judgmental, it's just the reality. Our churches are full of people uh, that are not actively engaged in serving the Lord as He has equipped them to do so. And uh, as, I, as I said last week, we just a little reminder from that is that we talked about finding purpose through the words of Christ. And we, we mentioned three major points there is, first of all, there has to be an encounter with Jesus, an encounter with Jesus. And I would encourage you this morning to, to ensure that your faith is real, that you have a certain standing with Christ. I love the music that we sang this morning because so much of it spoke so with such clarity uh, about what it means to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not by the things that we have done. It's not by our hard work and our effort or what church we attend or where we got baptized. But it's simply through the blood of Jesus Christ, which was offered as a perfect complete and a final sacrifice uh, for our sins. And, and by the way, don't, if you feel like, uh, are you being singled out as a sinner? No, because the Bible says we've all sinned. Uh, so nobody here is being singled out. We are all sinners. We come to the cross on, on an equal footing, regardless of where you've been. In fact, Paul gave this testimony. He said that he was the chief of sinners. And I used to say this all the time to people, that if God could save the chief, he could certainly save the rest of us, right? And, and Paul was the chief of sinners. And so we can, we can be assured today that if we want to have a relationship with God, if we want to be forgiven, if we want to have eternal life, that we can have it, not through this church, not through me as a pastor or, or any other pastor or evangelist or missionary or whatever it may be, but we can have salvation, we can have the assurance of eternal life through Jesus Christ, and thank God for that. So there has to be an encounter with Jesus. And as I mentioned to you last week, it's not typically something that we schedule and plan out. Uh, the day I got saved, I did not know until that very moment. I didn't know until I was encountered with the Word of God through the Spirit of God that that was the day that God was going to save me. And perhaps today you're here and, and uh, uh, you came in here for whatever reason it may be and uh, you didn't put it on your calendar today to meet Jesus, but today might be that day. And so I want to encourage you to be praying and thinking about that and opening your heart today uh, to the words of Christ because today may be that encounter that you have with Christ. And secondly, we talked about an invitation and Jesus said there to follow him. And it's, a, it's an invitation to everyone. Jesus is not looking for the smartest and the brightest and the best looking and the most educated. Thank God for that because that way we can all be there. And he is simply inviting all of us to come. And, and, and again, I think this is the tragedy of the American church today is I think that there are many people that will fill the pews of our churches across St. Petersburg, across Florida, and around North America. Many people will be sitting here today but are truly not following Jesus. Uh, now, the Bible speaks of those having a form of godliness and denying the power of thereof. It's very possible to look godly uh, and yet deny the power. And so Jesus would say to you, follow me. Follow me. And we know that when we follow him, he says, I'll make you. In other words, I'll transform you. I will change you. I will do everything that you need to have done in your life to allow you or to make you successful at following me is what Jesus would say. Thirdly, I mentioned last week that there's a decision that has to be made. 
And this is the hard part for us because, you know, we got a hold of our nets. We got a hold of our security. Remember, I brought the net last week and that represented the, the disciples and their income and their, their, their past and their present, their future. It represented their families. It represented literally everything. And perhaps today that you're holding on to something and you're struggling to give it up. And uh, I would encourage you today to make a decision, the most important decision that you'll ever make, of course, is to follow Christ. You see, the disciples could never discover their purpose with Jesus until they dropped their nets. And I, listen, I've met people, and I'm, maybe some of you have had the same experience, that I've met people in church life over the years that... Um, it seems like uh, it's just kind of a sense of apathy or a sense of mediocrity until there's just something happens in their life when the Lord gets a hold of them and some, for whatever reason, they decide at that point to give up everything and to go with Jesus. And then that is when they discover the fullness of all that God has for them. And, and I would encourage you today to, to let go of whatever it is that's preventing you from getting close to Jesus. I believe the Holy Spirit will show that to you if you allow him to, that if there's something right now that stands between you and the Lord, and I'm not talking about just lost people, I'm, I'm talking to Christians this morning that are holding so tight to a net, something in this world, some form of security, or so you think it is, you're holding on to that so tight, and yet we don't find our best in Christ until we let go of the net. And so I'm going to encourage you, as we talked about last week, to let go of your nets. So that brings us to this week, finding our purpose through spiritual gifts. And you'll turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12 with me. That's where I'm going to spend the bulk of my time here. Finding our purpose through spiritual gifts. So we know for a fact from what we looked at last week that Jesus wants us to follow him and to fish for men. All right, there's, there, there should be no argument there that, that he has a plan for every single life. Every single one of you this morning, there's no such thing as a clergy class and a laity class. You know, that's something that was in a kind of uh, an invention of the early church many, many, many years ago, centuries ago, that did a devastating impact upon modern church life. And that's when we elevated, if you will, once they called it the elevation of the priesthood over the laity. And what that caused was people to get the idea that only certain people are invited to follow and to serve the Lord. But the reality is today is that we can discover purpose in our life, each and every one of us, through spiritual gifts. And that's, you just heard a lot of these spiritual gifts. And again, I'm not going to go into the detail of the individual gifts here. But, but rest assured that God has given you everything you could possibly need today to follow him and to serve him and to discover that purpose that he has for your life. Let's look at, first of all, just briefly the meaning of spiritual gifts. So when you hear that expression, spiritual gifts, you'll know what it means is that it is a supernatural enablement for service. So the Bible teaches in the book of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, at the very moment that you put your faith and trust in Jesus, that you receive the Holy Spirit. That is something that, that's undeniable, that the Spirit comes, and the Bible says, until the day of redemption. That is, the Spirit will never depart from you. Now, there are times when we can grieve the Spirit, we can quench the Spirit, we can fight the Spirit, we can resist the Spirit, but the reality is, if you turn your heart to Jesus Christ and believe His death, His burial, and His resurrection, you open your heart by faith, the Bible teaches that the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you at that very moment that you believe the Gospel. And at that very moment, you also receive at least one, and probably for most of us, multiple spiritual gifts. Now, the reality is, and it's true that uh, sometimes on the very day that we get saved, this is true in my life, I didn't know all the spiritual gifts. In fact, I didn't even understand any of the spiritual gifts at that point. But the reality is, at the very day and hour, the very moment, the very second that you were saved, not only do you receive the Holy Spirit, but you receive the spiritual gifts. You see, you are a gifted person this morning. Not just simply by men, but you are gifted by God. And in fact, according to our definition, it's a supernatural enablement. You are able to serve the Lord. I've been in ministry a long time, and I've heard so often people say, you know, Pastor, I, I really want to do something, but I just, I just don't feel like I can serve God. I don't feel like I can do it. 
But can I tell you that according to what a spiritual gift really is, it is your ability to serve God, not, not by you mustering up the, the strength or whatever it may be, but God himself places that ability inside of you. So as you sit there right now, if you're a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, you have every ability that you need to serve the Lord. And by the way, I think that's where we find our purpose. You see, God didn't leave us behind just to muddle through this life and to try to, you know, bang around and try to figure out what we're supposed to do. I believe that God planted in the heart of each and every one of us an eternal purpose. And by the way, that's not something to be afraid of. I'm not up here with a bat, you know, ready to beat you over the head if you don't serve the Lord. You know, I know there's, in my background, I, I've spent enough years in churches like that where you feel like you're about to get hit over the head if you don't do something. You know, but the reality is it's not something we have to do. It's something that we get to do. Do you realize what a privilege it is to have the creator of all the universe to invite us? I mean, think about us. To serve, and not only to invite us, as we saw last week, but he also enables us to serve. Now, that doesn't mean that we are serving. It just simply means that we have the ability. As you sit there right now, as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the same Holy Spirit that any other believer in history has ever had, and you have gifts that God has given you to make you uniquely qualified to serve, and by the way, I think to find purpose. So it's, an, it's a divine enablement for service. That's the, uh, the uh, meaning of spiritual gifts. It's not a natural talent or an ability. Uh, it's not something, you know, some people uh, maybe have the ability to sing, and, and uh, thank God for that. Uh, certainly I don't have that one. Um, there's a lot of natural talents people have, maybe in construction or maybe uh, computers or things like that. It, it, that's not what it is. In fact, I think sometimes we get them confused and we see talented people doing things. And so we assume that maybe we're not gifted because, well, I can't sing and, and uh, I can't play a piano and, and I can't preach. So, so I guess maybe I'm left out. No, the truth is it's not according to our natural talents and abilities. And by the way, it's not the product of human effort. It's not something that you're going to have to go out and study. And, and, uh, and by the way, I'm not against education and training and so on. But it's not something that, well, after you get your Ph.D., then, then you could serve. Then you're qualified. And I know a lot of people like that, too. They'll, they'll look at a pastor and they say, well, you've been to seminary, so, so I could see how you could teach the Bible. And, well, you know, I'm just not educated. The truth is today, it's not according to our education. It's not according to our efforts. It's not according to how smart we are. It's simply something that God gives to us. Now, let's look at the description of these spiritual gifts found in verses 4 through 6. There's three summaries I'm going to give here. First of all, there are many kinds of gifts to be received. There are many kinds. And so in this room today, I would guarantee you that every spiritual gift that God offers is somewhere found in this body. Because there are many different types. And by the way, as we saw in the text, we're not to compare ourselves with somebody else or wish that we were like this person or that person. Because God has uniquely equipped you just as he desires you to be equipped. So there are many different types of gifts to be received. Secondly, there are many types of ministries represented. You might have you know, children's ministries, you might have music ministries, you might have uh, preaching ministries, you might have uh, ministries of helps and encouragement, you might have ministries of teaching or whatever it may be, but there are many, many types of ministries. In this body, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We don't need a hundred preachers. We don't need a hundred guitar players. But what we need is every person to simply to discover the enablement that God has given to you and to follow whatever that is that God's equipped you to do. And that's when the body becomes the healthiest. So there are many types of ministries. And then finally, there are many different outcomes from the gifts that are used. What that means is, is that, you know, sometimes we have a tendency in, in America here, we like to think of success as having more. So we think of an outcome is that, you know, the, the only way I can know that I've been successful is if I produce some great number. But the truth is that the, the production is in the hands of God. In other words, the fruit is in the hands of God. I can't manipulate things and make them happen in a way that pleases God. All right. You know, there's, there's, there's ways, of course, that we can do that, but they certainly don't please the Lord. So what I'm saying is that there are many 
many different types of, or excuse me, numbers of outcomes or fruits of our gifts. So, so you say, well, you know, God just doesn't seem to be using me because there's so little coming out of my life. Listen, don't, don't discount the little things that God does in our life because little is much when God is in it. And so this is a description of these spiritual gifts we find in verses four through six. But I also want you to notice that there's a danger of spiritual gifts. And we find that in verses one through three. Let's go back and look at that again. He says, now concerning spiritual uh, gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be uninformed. Uh, this is to be, first of all, Satan has weapons he's going to use against the church. There are things that, that Satan would level against this church to hold it down. And there, there's offensive weapons and Satan is against us. And one of these weapons is a weapon of ignorance. That there are many, many people that are ignorant of spiritual gifts. Now, that can be ignorant in the sense of not even knowing that they exist. Perhaps that's you today. And I'm, by the way, I'm not saying that to be critical of you, but I think there are a lot of Christians today that don't even know really that spiritual, exi that spiritual gifts exist or how they're to be used or any number of areas of ignorance that we can have in our life. And by the way, that is a tool of Satan to hold you down. As long as you remain ignorant of the gifts that God has given to you, Satan has got you right where he wants you. Because until you discover those gifts, you're not going to be effective in discovering the purpose for which God has placed you here for. So first of all, we have this, uh, this weapon of, uh, that Satan uses of ignorance. Secondly, there's a counterfeit offer. He talks about there in, in the next verse, he says, when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols. What a description, mute idols. By the way, mute idols is simply a uh, 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 false god. But the description there is a mute idol, which I think is important because the Holy Spirit placed that word in there, which gives you the idea that these false gods, they cannot speak. They cannot help. They cannot strengthen. And they cannot comfort. They cannot do anything. But somehow we find ourselves being led astray to things that can't help us. And it's a tool of Satan. He will fight us by offering us things that we think that we need, but they really don't help us. And the third weapon we see here is the weapon of spiritual bondage. That expression that he uses there, led astray. What I want you to do is get a picture in your mind right now. That expression in the original language has the idea of a prisoner in shackles being led by an armed guard. Somebody that is out of their own control now. And this is what Satan will do when we give ourselves over to him, is that he'll take control of our lives because we refuse to give our life to God. And so we get led astray, the Bible says here, and this is one of his weapons. I want you to move on quickly with me because we're moving through this passage. I want you to see the mutual dependency of the spiritual gifts now, the mutual dependency now, first of all, there's three principles I want to give you from, from these verses, from verses 12 through 26 that Ken has just read. The mutual dependency of these gifts, first of all, is found in the fact that the Spirit is who brings us together. Okay, so we find that down there in verse number 18, if you'll turn there in uh, chapter 12, in verse number 18, it says, But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. Now, what I want you to notice there is God is the one that makes the arrangement. That is, God is the one that builds the body. It's no accident that you're here today. And by the way, I think this is why it's so important that we have the right attitude towards the local church, because it is God's church that he places together. If you think of a, of a large jigsaw puzzle, if you will. And all those individual pieces, which sometimes don't seem like they fit together, but in the end, they make a beautiful picture. That is exactly what God is doing. He is choosing the individual members to place them in the body as he chooses. We also notice down there at verse number 24, it says, which um, our more presentable parts do not require it, but God has so composed the body, giving uh, greater honor to the part that lacked it. So God has composed the body. I want you to hold on to that expression. God has placed the body together. So, so first of all, we see that the Spirit brings us together. And by the way, that's exciting because if you say, well, I don't know if God's working in my life. Yes, He is. He brought you here. 
That's the first indication that God is at work because God is bringing you into this portrait now to put us together as a beautiful picture. But you're one of those pieces that are important. Have you ever seen a, a, a jigsaw puzzle that misses a couple pieces? It just doesn't look right, does it? You're not going to put that up on your wall, are you? It's just something about that just doesn't quite look right. And that's the picture of the church when members of the body are missing. You are important to this body. That's what I'm trying to say. The Spirit has brought you here. Notice also that every member is valued. We look down there at verses 15 through 20. We'll not take the time to read all that, but think about this. You know, it's kind of like uh, the eye saying to the ear, I don't need you. I can see just fine. All right, but, but without the ears, what happens? You can't hear. And, the, and, the, and the, the ears say to the feet, well, you're kind of ugly. I don't need you. But how would you like to see your ears try to move around without any feet and so on? And that's the picture that we get here. And so the important thing that we see here is that every member is valued. You know, this is something you ought to, and you ought to, you ought to understand this, this morning is that you have a great value to this body. Now, maybe nobody's ever brought you up to the platform and recognized you or given you an award or a certificate or a trophy. But, you know, that's not important. If we believe the word of God at face value, the truth is you are so valued in this body. You know, and you think about and the, the picture we have here. And if there's anybody here that's involved in the medical field, imagine a human body where just a small part of our of our inner body that it's not functioning correctly. Or maybe we could ask it this way, which would you rather do away with today, your brain, your lungs, or your heart? Well, they're all important, right? And we could keep on going. You know, our, our, our digestive system and, and our muscular system and our skeletal system. And, and, you know, what part do you want to get rid of today? Well, when you put it that way, I don't want to get rid of any of it, right? And that's the way God views his church. You know, you may not be the prominent member that's in front of everything, and you may feel that nobody ever notices me, but trust me, if you're not functioning, the body's not healthy. And that's, what's, that's I think, what's hurting our churches is that maybe somehow we've elevated certain people and put others down to the point where those that feel like they're not being recognized, perhaps maybe they don't feel like they even need to contribute, and because of that, the body is not healthy. So we need to step up and see where is that role that we play. And though it may not be the most prominent role, it is certainly important to God. And that's something I want you to understand today before we leave here. That you have something very important to contribute to this body. You do. And far more than just simply coming in and sitting and listening to a message once a week or praying or, or, or singing songs with us. But, but listen, every time you walk in here, you ought to be reminded that you are an important member of this body. You don't have to be on this platform to be important to God. Where you sit right now with the gifts that he's given you, your gifts may not be the thing that gets recognized the most. But trust me, you are a vital part of the health of this body and the truth is you may be sitting back and kind of waiting for the future and to see well, what happens when we, when we call a pastor and what happens when the church takes the next chapter of its life and you may be sitting back but trust me listen do more than just sit back get involved serve the Lord right now don't say one day don't say tomorrow because the health of this body is so dependent upon what you are doing right now in obedience or, if I will, the response to the, the gifts that God has given you. You're an important part of this body. And thirdly, not only is every member valued, but thirdly, we rise together and we fall together. And this is something that we have got to embrace as a church. We've got to understand that when one of us is suffering we're all suffering. And when one of us is rejoicing, we should all rejoice. We rise together. We fall together. You see, this ought to be the most attractive body in all of this city. There's, you know, I just think about this. There's thousands of bikers on the beach right now. And you might go down there and, and, and have some fun and listen to some music and eat some food and all that. But the truth is, this body right here, if it's functioning at a healthy level, it's far more important than any large gathering for whatever festival it may be. Because what we're doing in this body is so critically important in light of eternity. 
And, and trust me, today, we, we have got to realize that every single one of us offers something to this body. We rise together and we fall together. Is there somebody in the, in the body today that hurts? Then we should hurt with you. Is there somebody in the body today that's rejoicing? Then we should rejoice with you. That's the mutual dependency of the spiritual gifts. We cannot all be an eye. We cannot all be an ear. We cannot all be an arm. But together with what we are, we can make a beautiful body together. The next thing I want you to notice here is uh, the giving of the spiritual gifts. We find that in verse number seven. And this is really important. I want you to turn back to verse seven. Verse seven says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So we see the purpose of the spiritual gifts is first of all, to manifest God. I want, you to, I want you to hold on to this with me. Look at verse number seven again. But to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. So what is a spiritual gift? We can see a spiritual gift here is a manifestation of the Spirit. Now manifestation is a, is a simple word which simply means to, to make clear. So, you know, if you read your Bible, the Old Testament, the most prominent member of the Trinity that's exposed there is God the Father. As you get into the Gospels, you'll find that the most prominent member of the Trinity is the Son. But in the church age, the most prominent member of the Trinity that we should see is the Holy Spirit. But how do we see the Holy Spirit? To many of us, the Spirit seems to be such a mystery. Some, in some versions, we see the Spirit uh, translated the Holy Ghost. And we think, a ghost? You know, that's a real mystery. But the reality is that, that He has given each and every one of us a gift so that he is manifested. So, and we could go back and look at those listing of gifts. So as we go out, as we do the gifts of mercy, let's say, as we do those, as we follow that gifting in us, if we have the gift of mercy, and as we exercise mercy in our life, then people can see the Holy Spirit in us and through us. That's what it is, a manifestation. You say, boy, I just wish God could show up in our community. He can and he will. This is his body. And as we exercise our gifts in the community and towards others, then people can see that's more than a religion. That's more than just some kind of social club. But there's something special going on over there because that's God. You see, God is different than all these other things we could talk about. But how can people see God? Through the manifestation of of the Spirit. So, first of all, the purpose of spiritual gifts is to manifest God. And then secondly, we see here, for the good of others. It says there in verse number seven, it says the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. See, here's the problem with spiritual gifts. If, let's say that this represents my spiritual gift. This gift that God has given me is supposed to be to help other people. It's not for me. All right. So that's what it says here. It is to manifest God to help other people. Let's put it in uh, kind of a paraphrase it that way. So this is my spiritual gift. What does God want me to do with it? He wants me to share it with other people. He wants me to use it in ministry to others. But watch what happens. So many people who profess to know Christ are taking their spiritual gifts and they're tucking them away somewhere in private. Now, what good is that to you now? Oh, it might make me look good, right? Because I still have the gift. And, and you might say, wow, look at that, that gift that he has. And what ends up happening is we then elevate people rather than God. But this gift was not meant to put in my coat pocket. This is to manifest God and for the good of others. And so the longer that you sit on a spiritual gift, the more that God remains hidden and people are not receiving the good that they should from you. Now, I don't say that to put a guilt trip on you. That's not why we should serve God. 
But you're sitting there today maybe feeling sorry for yourself or feeling dejected or put down like you have nothing of value to offer. So you take the spiritual gift and you hide it away. And God is saying, no, that gift is to manifest me and it's to help other people. It's urgent today that we find out what it is that God has gifted us with and we use that then to manifest him and for the good of other people. Can you imagine what kind of body that this would be if every person sitting here right now with all their heart and all their passion were putting God on display and for the good of other people? Man, people would want to come to a place like that. What's going on over there at that Grace Bible Church? I want, I want, to, I want to come in. There's something special there. Because we can see the evidence of God and we can see that they're helping other people. But I want you to notice finally, and I'll close with this, number five, the giving of spiritual gifts. We go back to verse number seven. It says, the first two words in the ESV says this, to each is given. In fact, look at verse number six, back up there, the last part of that verse. But it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So the recipient of the spiritual gift is every believer. Every single person is empowered by God. That's what it says. That's what we just read in the scripture right here. You see, I don't feel the power. You know, and I think I've given this illustration before, but it's kind of like sitting in a high-powered vehicle, but you don't turn the key on. People might admire the beauty of the vehicle and, and think of the potential that's inside that, under that, that, that engine, but until that key is turned over, until you put that thing in gear and do all that that vehicle is designed to do, it really doesn't really operate as it should, and it doesn't do anything. And you see, every person sitting here right now that has received Christ as your Savior, you have the power of God in you. Spiritual gifts have been given to you, which enable you to manifest God and to serve others. But until you turn the key... In other words, until you take that step of faith to say, I'll serve. I'll explore this. I'll find out what that gift is. And by the way, some of you may not even know what your spiritual gift is, and that's fine. Listen, there are things, even online today, they have spiritual gifts inventories that you can take. There's, there's uh, leaders of the church here that can help you with this. I'd be happy to help you with it, to talk you through that. Listen, you've got to find your spiritual gift. You've got to know what it is. Because until you do, you'll have no idea what purpose it is that God has put you here for. You'll just be like that, that person that just kind of wanders in and out. And we see Christians like that all the time. They're bouncing everywhere. They never seem to, to find a home because they have no purpose. I urge you today. Oh, I, how I urge you today to discover that spiritual gift and then to exercise that gift and while nobody, well, listen, you may do it in complete secret. and People may not even notice it because your gift may not be one of the public gifts. But trust me, God knows it. And what happens is the whole body begins to benefit by what you're doing that maybe nobody else even notices. Think about all the parts in our body right now that are going on inside that you're not even thinking about. How many of you stayed up last, all last night to make sure that your lungs kept breathing? How many of you stayed up last night, kept poking yourself to make sure your heart just beat through the night? You see, there's a lot of things that happen without us even thinking about it. And the truth is today, you ought to be following the gifts that God has given. You ought to be exercising those gifts. And while you may not be applauded for it in front of men, God knows. And you are contributing a vital part of the health of this church. Let's pray together. With our heads are bowed for prayer, perhaps there's somebody here today and you can't have a spiritual gift until you have the Spirit of God living in you. I urge you today not to, to join the church or get baptized or do some religious thing, but I urge you today to do something very simple. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It really is that simple, that Jesus has provided everything. When he hung on the cross and shed his blood and died, when he died, he said, it is finished. Man would never again have to make effort 
Because God himself came to seek and to save that which is lost. If you're here this morning and the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, our heads are bowed for prayer, but you're sitting here and you say, Greg, I, I'm not ready to meet God. I'm not saved. But I'd like you to pray for me. I'm not going to call your name out, but please let me pray for you. Would you slip your hand up in the air? Say, I'm not saved, but I'd like to. I'd like you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up good and high so I can see who you are? Just put it up, put it right back down. Maybe you're here this morning and I anticipate this would be true. You say, Greg, for whatever reason, I'm not exercising fully the gifts that God's given me. Maybe it's that you don't know them. Maybe you've just put them on the shelf for a while. I, I don't know. I, I'm not your judge. But who would say this morning, would you pray for me, Greg? I want to exercise those gifts that God's given me. Just a simple invitation. Would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you. Well, many, many hands have gone up. That's great honesty. Thank you for that. Anybody else before I pray? I'm not going to call your name out. I'm not going to embarrass you. Father in heaven, thank you so much. I saw a number of hands going up. Father, I pray that I know that my words are feeble and sometimes my thoughts are not clear. But God, I pray that the one thing that's clear today is that you have been a wonderful, gracious God. You've given us the gifts of the Spirit. And so, Lord, I pray today for those that specifically that raise their hand today that would say, God, help me. I want to live out. I want to express these gifts. I want others to benefit by what you've given to me. So, Father, I pray, Lord, if it's meaning to discover what the gift is or how to use it or whatever it may be, God, I pray that they'll not just sit on this knowledge, but, Lord, I pray that they'll seek out help. Thank you, God, for this wonderful opportunity that we can have to take the next step in our faith. In Jesus' name, amen.